welcome to Bay Tales Live number three. I'm Rick Watson and this is Simon Buick. Oh. It's always a pleasure. Sorry, I just spoke over you there, Simon. How rude of me. It's always a huge pleasure to be hosting some of the biggest and best names in crime fiction. And tonight is absolutely zero exception. We have a review from Alex Hawley of Hawley Reviews, a reading from Stephanie Roble, and a conversation between two members of the murder squad, Anne Cleves and Kath Staincliffe. We also have competitions, music from Anna Levine, and much more. A couple of things in case you haven't visited us before here at Bay Tales. There should be a chat facility along the bottom of your screens. Some of you are using it already. Thank you. Um, use all panellists and attendees to ensure everybody sees your message. And we do ask that you try to keep chat to a minimum when people are speaking. There is a Q&A facility along the bottom somewhere as well. So if you have a bane in question. This really isn't catching on. It's like the third time I've tried it and nobody's laughing. But anyway, if you have a burning question, drop it in the Q&A box and I will try my best to ask it for you. If you've ever been to one of our events before, welcome back. If you haven't and this is your first time, thank you for joining us. If I hear something impressive, I will give a little woo. Don't be offended. It's not sarcastic. It is genuine. And you should definitely do the woos in the chat if you can as well. You can chat about us on social me media using hashtag Baytales Live and you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter with at underscore Baytales. Simon, over to you. Thanks. So um, we're going to start as we do each week, uh, each, each episode, um, with a couple of books that are coming out next month. Um, Vic and I are going to run through three titles that have caught our eyes. Um, we will be giving some of those books away. Um, so watch the break when we'll be giving more information about that. Um, and then we'll be passing over to our in-depth review of the week, Alex Hawley. So do keep watching and he'll do it properly. Whereas we just kind of go, I really like that. <laughs> Professional. So um, three books, the first, and, and I've got them all on Kindle. Well, I've got two of them on Kindle. So it's really unimpressive to hold up Kindle and show. But the first book um, coming out, uh, out now actually is The Art of Death by David Fennell. This is actually the next book on my Kindle to read. And the description says, 18 years ago, Detective Inspector Grace Archer escaped a notorious serial killer. Now she and a caustic DS, Harry Quinn, must hunt down another. When three glass cabinets appear in Trafalgar Square, each containing the floating corpses of three homeless men, it appears at first to be some shock art installation, but then it becomes clear the bodies are real. And when the cabinets are traced to an underground arts known only as anonymous with the message more will follow, Archer and Quinn have a race against time to find the killer as more bodies begin to appear around London landmarks. I can't tell you much more than that um, as I've only read the first chapter. Um, first chapter is great. Um, what I can tell you is that Zafre have very kindly given us copies to give away, so do watch the break closely and enter our prize draw to get your own copy. The second book I have read, and, and this is a bit of a personal one for us, Vic, um, this is Anthrax Island from um, Danny Marshall, um, publishing as DL Marshall. Um, I'm just watching the side of my screen here where I've got this showing from an audience participation. My, my iPad is just connecting and disconnecting. So I hope that's not happening for everyone else. It's, it's, it's a good job we're not flying a plane. That's all I can say. Anyway, Danny is, is known to us from Virtue Noir at the Bar. And um, I did ask him if it was okay to say this, um, but Danny read for us in the early days at the bar and we were so impressed um, by Danny's reading and, and several other unpublished authors at the time, that we set up a private session for a selection of publishers. Now, we haven't actually talked about this before, because we're just, you know, the philanthropic type that like to, to keep these things private, except now we're shouting about it to everyone. <laughs> but we did a private session for a selection of publishers who came along, where we introduced, introduced some of our favourite unpublished authors that had spoken at the bar. And Danny, despite a dodgy internet connection, which I can completely relate to at the moment, he wowed everyone reading from his book Anthrax Island. So it was no surprise to us that the, the book was bought up by Canelo. It's the first new series featuring John Tyler. And the research Danny's done is just really, really impressive. 
it's fiction based very much on fact. And the fact being in 1942, the UK government began the testing of biological weapons on, and I could do with Danny here just to check I'm not butchering this, Grunard Island, a Scottish island approximately two kilometers long by one kilometer wide. And the aim was to create an anthrax weapon to use against Germany. The test was successful, but it was never used and the island was left contaminated. So Danny's novel follows the premise that scientists have now returned to the island and find themselves stranded due to a breakdown of equipment. John Tyler has flown in to sort out the problem only to find the problem goes far beyond broken equipment as the bodies start to mount. Now we know Danny can write a great locked room story from his contribution to Noir from the Bar, still available on Amazon, all, pro uh, <laughs> all profits going to NHS charities. So um, we knew his background with lockdown mysteries and this really is a locked room mystery, unabashed action. If you like the classic Alistair McLean, Desmond Bagley, Jack Higgins, look for this book coming out on the 15th of March. And lastly, um, that I'm going to mention is um, one of the big, one of the big uh, boys and girls out there, uh, Harlan Coben's new one, uh, Win. I haven't read it, despite my best efforts to blag a copy from the publishers, which just didn't work. Uh, I have managed the first chapter. For those who've read Harlan Coben, they may know, um, they may have seen he's developed in some of a, a Harlan Coben universe, a bit like Marvel did in the films where characters from various books are coming in and, and appearing. His long running Myron Bolitar, the sports agent, come investigator with some sort of CIA past that we're never quite sure of series is, is kind of finished, but there's been a number of side characters who've appeared in the series popping up. So his nephew Mickey in the trilogy of young adult novels, his lawyer Hester Crimstein, and now ones that fans of the series have been waiting for, his long-term ally and best friend, Windsor Horn Lockwood III, or Wynn, the anti-hero with psychopathic tendencies and interesting morals, I think you could say. This one puts Wynn center stage in, as he investigates a murder and what really happened to his mother when she was kidnapped over 20 years ago. I don't know much more about it than that, but it's such a fantastic character and I can't wait to read this one with him center stage. Because frankly, I think he's a more interesting character than, than Myron Bolotar was. So certainly more dangerous. So that's, that's my views, uh, my, my choices coming up. Vic, what's yours? Well, I've read two out of the three that I'm going to talk about today, so I'm feeling very smug. Um, One Step Behind by Lauren North is about a doctor called Jenna who has kids, a husband and a successful career. She also has a stalker. Disturbing gifts are left on her doorstep, someone's lurking whenever she leaves the house and her colleagues are receiving quite vile emails about her. But when the stalker is brought into hospital after a serious accident, the power switches. Lauren North does this brilliant thing of writing about a very, very normal woman, a very relatable woman in just a horrible situation. It's set in the middle of a really hot, cloying summer, which kind of increases the oppression and just the horrible, cloying attention of this stalker. You don't, I didn't know who to trust. I, there's questions on whether um, Jenna is reliable or not. It is just totally gripping and I just couldn't stop reading it. Um, my second book is Black Widows by Kate Quinn. Um, Blake Nelson is a Mormon. He has three wives. He lives in a hidden stretch of land in the wilds of Utah, and that's where he's found dead. Um, who's to blame? It's a really intriguing sub subject because I think a lot of people are interested in, in Mormons anyway, especially when you talk about the polygamy and things like that. The three... Um, wives have all got distinctive voices they're unique characters they're so different but all so interesting for different reasons and again this was one where i should have been going to sleep several hours earlier but i just couldn't stop reading it so highly highly recommend and finally my next read which i haven't started yet the whispers by heidi perks anna robinson hasn't been seen since she went on a night out with her four closest friends she's got a loving husband and a son she adores Surely she wouldn't abandon them and her perfect life. But what has happened? At the school gates, it's not long before the rumours start. Anna's oldest friend is beside herself with worry, looking for answers, certain somebody's hiding something. With each day that passes, Anna's life is under increasing threat and a pressure mounts. It won't be long before something cracks. 
so um yeah really looking forward to getting stuck into that one so they're my three for this week but like simon says there is someone who is a far more competent interviewer than no not interviewer reviewer than he or i so i would like to welcome alex hawley let me tell you a little bit about alex Alex has been running Hawley Reviews since 2016 when he first went to Thixton's Crime Festival. Alex has interviewed many notable authors including Jeffrey Deaver, Ian Rankin, Val McDermott and very, and very many more. Woo Recently Alex has gone live on a Facebook group called UK Crime Book Club and does a weekly Monday live author chat. He's interviewed Chris Brookmeyer and Ellie Griffiths among others. He studied criminology and law at uni and has a passion for all things crime related. Alex is actually in the um, process of writing his first book. So everybody, please give a huge round of applause to Alex Hawley. Here we go, everybody. Sound first. <laughs> and picture. Yay. Um, Hello, um, this is a little bit weird for me because this is actually my first live review. So um, bear with me because I'm trying to remember all this verbally because I can't read it. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about Graham Bragg's Death in Delft, which came out on the 9th of February on audio. Um, this is actually the first of four in a series and it follows a religious scholar who has been called in by the mayor of Delft to discover what's happened to three girls that went missing and in Delft um, there is a famous artist that you may well all be aware of called Vermeer who is um, tasked by the mayor and and the detective to um, draw likenesses of the girls, try it out and draw them and see what happened to them by going round the town of Delft to interview people. Um, th this book covers everything from cl class to um, money and religion too. Um, in, the, in the time of 1870, it is very difficult to hide the fact that you uh, may well be Catholic when everybody is Protestant. Protestant <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, for, the, for the detective in this book, um, there is lots of things that he is, he is using, like um, geographical profiling, which is a nod and a wink to modern policing techniques, which is well used by Graham Back. And the narrator, Alex Wyndham, is um, really good in this because he manages to tell everyone from from two different age ranges of the character, because the book is actually the diary of um, the detective from the, the past that he's telling people the story backwards. So it opens as an old man and goes to younger. Um, I can't, I can't really tell you much more. I'm going to give you the tab book so I'll go back to Vic and just leave it there. I'll... Thank you so much for that Alex that was brilliant. No problem. That was an absolute pleasure to host you and one day we'll have you back when your book's out as well. Thank you very much. I hope it won't be too long. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Okay so to the main event. Before we get on with it I'm going to apologise, I've got a really itchy nose and I just can't stop scratching it. Um, if you have some questions for Kath or Anne, please do drop it in the Q&A box and I will endeavour to ask them for you. So, to our main event. 
Anne Cleves is the author of over 30 critically acclaimed novels, including the Vera Stanhope and Shetland series on which ITV's and BBC One's dramas are based. She has worked as a probation officer, librarian, bird observatory cook and auxiliary coast guard before she started writing and remains a passionate champion for libraries. Anne has been awarded the highest accolade in crime writing, the 2017 CWA Diamond Dagger, mm -hmm. and is a member of the Murder Squad, working with other British Northern writers to promote crime fiction. Anne lives in North Tyneside, probably equidistant between where Simon and I live, um, and her recent novel, The Long Call, is set in Devon, where she grew up. North Tyneside is where the Vera books are set, and her latest novel, The Darkest Evening, is coming out in paperback tomorrow. The Long Call, switching back to that, was number one some Sunday Times bestseller and has been optioned for TV. So huge round of applause, everybody, for Anne Cleves. And on to Kath. Kath Steencliffe is an award-winning novelist, radio playwright, and creator of ITV's hit series, Blue Murder. She also writes the Scott and Bailey tie-in books. Kath has been shortlisted for the CWA New Blood Dagger and the Dagger in the Library. Ooh. She won the Short Story Dagger in 2012 and the Writers Guild of Great Britain's Best Radio Drama Award in 2019. Ooh. Kath's standalone novels examine the impact of crime on ordinary families and her latest title is Quiet Acts of Violence. So everybody, huge round of applause for Kath Staincliffe. Lovely ladies. Thank you for joining us tonight. How many books are you each up to now? Kath, how many is it for you? I've just um, completed my 27th, which just seems ridiculous to me. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, have I really written that many books? But I have been at it quite a long time. My first one was published in 1994, so wow. last century. Yeah. <laughs> And Anne, how many are you up to now? Well, that's nothing, because my first was published in 1986. It must be 33 now, I think, or 34 even. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot. That but one is... Persistence pays out. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to dive straight in, because I have a feeling we'll have quite a few questions from our audience. When you're coming up with a new story, where do you begin? Is it a situation, a crime, a character? I'm going to go to Anne first and then I'll come oh. to you, Kath, if that's okay. With me, it's always the place first. So I always know where it's set. Um, and then I think the situation and the characters grow from that. Because as I've said lots of times before, I think we are, we are the people, we are where we grow up and the kids that we played in the street with and the community that we belong to. And so I need to know that really before I start creating any of the, the rest of the, the characters. But ideas for stories come from snippets of overhead conversation in the Metro or, yeah, just something you might have read in the newspaper or heard on the radio. So, but, but it's always place that I start with. Thank you. And you, Kath? I think for me, it's it's a sort of question or a situation like what would it be like to experience your daughter going missing on a gap year or somebody asking you to help them end their life? How would you deal with that? How would you cope? But as soon as I had that idea, I, I can't take it any further without knowing who the, the characters are, whose story it is. So that's that's then the next stage. I can't, I can't write anything about it. I can't begin the process of writing until I know whose point of view it's from, who these people are, what their daily lives are generally like. I, I've got to flesh all that out in order to start. Um, I mean, I think with my police procedural books, it always starts with a body. But of course, I have to know who that body is, who that person was. Yeah. Or her or, or his, you know, family connections, friends, occupation, etc. So again, it comes back to character pretty, pretty quickly. And a common thread in both your work seems to be normal people pushed to the brink. What do you think makes that such an interesting idea to return to, Kath? I'll start with you. 
I think I'm really interested in stories that have some sort of universality or commonality. Um, I'm not really interested in writing about a celebrity or people with millions of dollars of money or, or sort of, you know, very odd high concept worlds that are beyond my ken. I'm um, more interested in sort of, you know, things where that could happen to me or my neighbour or my gram or, you know what I mean? It's that sort of um, identification with the situation and, and the, the sense of there but for the grace of God go I. Um, and I think, you know, our ordinary, ordinary people's lives and how they're ruptured, it's just such a rich scene to mine. I don't, I don't think you ever run out of sort of possibilities with that. Great, thank you. And Anne? Yeah, I'm a bit like Kath. It, it's the ordinary people that I'm interested in because I don't think that any one of us is ordinary. We're all interesting. and We've all got something that is worth finding out about. I, I'm not, I'm certainly not interested in writing about monsters. You know, I'm, I'm mm. not interested in psychopaths or serial killers or, um, so that doesn't interest me at all, really, as a reader or a writer. So I'm looking for... And because I write very traditional murder mysteries, so it does start with the body. It is about what might have made people like me put themselves in such a situation where they feel the, the stress that they need to kill or the result of the murder on the community too. Mm -hmm. And what, what that does to, a, to other ordinary people. I read, um, I've read, books by both of you quite recently. So Anne, with regards to The Darkest Evening, and um, that's in the middle of a snowstorm, similar to what we had last week um, in Northumberland. Yeah. Um, you evoke such a beautiful sense of community and also the setting itself in your work. How did you achieve that? I know bits of, of North Northumberland quite well. So that was easy, you know, getting that sense of, being almost hugged by the forest and the and, and I was I, I think we all anybody who writes in Britain writes about class either directly or indirectly and in the darkest evening it's it's more direct because it is set around a sort of crumbling stately home because I wanted to play with the idea of the, the classic country house murder mystery and so I'm look I wanted to look at that and and the responsibility and the sense of obligation, but also that com confidence that comes with owning land mm. and how that relationship is, is built and is twisted within a community. And actually the landowners are far more dependent on the people who work with them for them than, than, than is the other way around. So yeah, I was, I was very, it was just a kind of metaphor, I suppose, for looking at, at that. I really loved um, the conversations that were overheard in village tea rooms and in the shops in the village. That's, that seemed really sort of familiar to me to when I've been in small communities and seen um, or overheard certain things. Conversely, Kath, the most recent book of yours that I read on Anne's recommendation was The Girl in the Green Dress. Yes. Yeah. And that is, um, that's just Manchester, isn't it? It is yeah. solidly in the city. Um, but it, you seem to know it so, so well, and you evoke it so, so well. Do you have a wander around the city when you're writing, or is it just the fact that it's somewhere you're familiar with? Mainly I'm familiar with it. If I've got a particular idea for a location that perhaps I haven't visited for 10 or 15 years, mm. uh, then, then I might actually, you know, go to it to just see whether, you know, is the Greyhound track still at Bellevue or not, for example, that sort of thing. Um, but I think I do know it well. And uh, in, my, in my previous job, before I became a writer full time, I was working as a community artist. So I worked with a lot of the communities around Manchester and around the Northwest. So went into areas that I wouldn't normally have needed to go to because I was working with youth clubs or play schemes or mm. mother's groups or whatever it was to, to deliver arts projects. But I think one thing about, I mean, I love, I love the darkest evening and that whole setting that Anne created, but I think, and I love fiction where the, the setting's really vivid and you can lose yourself in it. 
and it's even better if it's an unfamiliar setting as far as I'm concerned because you learn so much yes but I think one tip I was taught when I used to go to um, creative writing workshops when I was starting out was to think of all the senses when you're describing a place it's not just what it looks like but what does it make you feel like what's the temperature like what are there smells on the air what are the sounds that you associate with that place and I think that can can give you a very rich sense of location because especially if it's somewhere you, you don't know so you can't imagine it instantly as a reader but you can if the writer puts all that detail in yeah and you you really did that in the girl in the green dress I could hear the noises of the club and feel the warm air on my skin and ingrained with the dirt and stuff it was brilliant um you've both written series and standalones what would you say are the main differences whoever wants to go first lucky dip i'll go first. um shall i go first i've ri only written two standalones so i've written standalones that have turned into series though which says something perhaps about my enjoying writing series because I do once I've got into a character that I really enjoy writing about I want to write about them some more because I want to find out more about them or put them in different situations so um so I think I can't imagine going back and starting and doing another standalone unless there's a story that really leaps out at me um that will will work that way but I'm I do love that possibility of developing a character over several books because Vera wasn't meant to be a series a recurring character was she no and that's why she appears about halfway through the crow trap and people get a bit grumpy because they expect her to be there from the beginning and she's, <laughs> she's not Kathy from what I understand I think you've written more standalones is that right do you think it, I've written it 11 standalones so a little more series that including right. the scott and bailey and the yeah. and the blue murder novels that i've done from the screenplays um i think for me this the series there's there's a lovely familiarity with the series you're going back to a character that you want as anne said you want to spend more time with you don't have to invent them you might discover more about them but you don't and you don't have to find a new location and you, you know, you don't have to do all that scene setting. Whereas for me, I think standalones have given me the opportunity to write crime fiction that isn't detective fiction. So all my series are series about either private eye or police procedurals. Whereas my standalones are are not about detectives, they're about the people who are impacted by crime. So they might be victims or witnesses. And I think the other thing that stand writing standalones gives me is a chance to experiment in a way that wouldn't be acceptable in a series that's already established the sort of tone and the modus operandi. So for example, I could write a book that was all written in letter form in, in letters to my daughter's killer. Uh, I couldn't have got away with that as a sort of, um, you know, um, Sal Kilkenny story. It just, it, like Anne says, it, it, it wouldn't fit. It, it needed a different format. And I could write another one that had nine viewpoints of a group of passengers trapped on a train, which again, you know, is completely outside the sort of investigation style and structure. So I like to be able to try both, to do both. Because you've mentioned the silence between breaths, we actually had a question from um, your fellow, fellow Northwestern author, Rob Parker, mm -hmm. who's, who said, the silence between breaths is about an act of terrorism on a train. You told the story from multiple points of view, including that of the bomber and his family. How do you manage to bring out the humanity in the most damnedest of places of pe and people? Well, I'm glad that he found it to, to be doing that because that's what, what you aim for, I think. Um, I think the simple answer is that we are all human. And so I'm not interested, I don't believe in evil people uh, and big bad villains. I believe people do bad things. 
but I'm actually not interested in two dimensional baddies in, in the stories. Um, so even those characters that I detest or dislike or disagree with, I have to find something in them that I can actually relate to and empathize with. Mm -hmm. And I don't start writing until I've got that for all my characters. And I think I particularly, I was particularly concerned in that novel to explore the impact of that act of terrorism on the family of the perpetrator because they were victims just as much as any of the, the other families involved. And I think it's not, a, it's not a perspective we hear very much of or see very much of in terms of those people who are related to murderers or, or to suicide bombers or to water, you know, in that way. So um, it gave me an opportunity to look at that as well. But, you know, under the skin, we're all people and we're all capable of all sorts of wonderful things and terrible things. Yeah. Brilliant. And I think that's what we do as writers, isn't it? We have to get inside the skin of, of every character that we're writing and see the world through their eyes. Otherwise, they are just two dimensional and nobody's going to be terribly interested in them. We have to know why they do things and why, why all our characters act as they do. And part of that is, is imagination and part of that is a sort of um, psychological archaeology going back into their pasts and find out what's yeah. what in your case what might have radicalized the the terrorist or mm. what gave his sisters the courage to speak out about him in that book which was, was really yeah. strong yeah. i thought yeah well, thank you and while we're on i've also got um a question from emma i think it's palin or it could be palin i'm sorry emma I'm sorry in advance. Um, Emma would like to know, how do you write a convincing murder mystery? Do you start with the actual murder and work backwards like Columbo? Uh, no, because I don't know how it ends when I start because it has to be fun for me. I have to um, be as surprised as the reader as I'm reading. I Like Kath, I need to know who the people are and I need to know where. And finding each book has a different, slightly different voice and a different world. And so I need to, to get into that. But the story itself grows as I write. And so I need that, that, I need that surprise ending as well, because I do love that cheap thrill of the surprise ending. I do love the, the traditional detective novel. It's what, it's, it was always my comfort reading as I was growing up and it still stays with me. So Kath, yeah, no, I'd, I certainly don't know who did it and worked backwards. Excellent. Kath, do you work differently or in a similar way? Um, I, was, I was trying to sort of think then when Anne was talking. Um, I don't always know, I don't always know who did it, but I know I've got to know by the time I get to the end. But I think it is similar to Columbo in the sense that you've got a body, you've got post-mortem, you've got your forensics in, you're, you're retracing that person's last hours, then you're retracing their last years and working out who they might have had made enemies of and who stands to gain from their death. So I think we're all familiar with that structure from, from our reading and from all the TV dramas that employ it and so on and movies. So I think it's quite useful for writers starting out that Crime fiction does give us these templates, if you like, for writing. Now, whether or not when you start, you know who's done it and you know where you're going to put your red herrings or whether you're stumbling around <laughs> on your way there, which is more like the path that Anne and I take, I think. We're wandering over these hilltops, sort of knowing our destination is the, the valley below, but not quite sure whether we'll see a signpost or fall in a, in a, a pit or yeah. whatever on the way. So, um, but that structure. That's right though, it's a great, yeah, it's, it's a great genre for new writers, I think, because if you, like, I always felt that I, I could do character all right, but then I wasn't sure what I was going to do with them. So I created these very interesting characters, but you couldn't just have them sitting in a room chatting all day. <laughs> but. But with that structure of a, of a crime novel, 
I think it's a it's a, a, a nice way in for new writers to to give it a go. And moving on from that, have you got any advice for pre-published writers who might be listening in this evening? I for me, it's get to the end as soon as you can. So write. Don't don't try and edit as you go along too much. Just try and get that basic structure of the story down or of the book down. There is a great temptation to polish the first chapter because that's safe because you've written it and you go back and and that's lovely. I love doing that, but you need to get to the end first. Just do the scary bit. Get the story down before you you start I, editing. Yeah, yeah. I'd echo that. Just get on with it. Finish it. <laughs> Uh, but I, I'd also say, um, try and discover your own voice. Because I think we all, you know, we all tell the same stories over and over again, basically. And I think what you bring to it is just your way of telling them. And, and to find your voice, I think you've got to try and establish where your strengths are and develop those and try those and, and, and sort of grow that distinction if you like in the way you so the way I write a, a chapter will be completely different to the way Anne does or anybody else in Murder Squad or anybody else writing crime you know we'll all have our own way of saying it. Great um Kath, your next book I believe is out in July and it's called Running Out of Road is that correct? Yeah. Can you tell us anything about that? Yes it's um it's about 11 year old Scarlett who is abducted one day by her estranged father and driven up into the peaks uh, in Derbyshire. He is on the police's most wanted list. So they drive up, up into the, in, into the hills with the police in pursuit. And while Scarlett tries to work out how on earth she can escape from this man and this situation. Her path crosses with various other individuals who are also up in those hills. Some of them are, are hiding and some of them are trying to evade justice on their own account. And some of them are seeking justice. So there's this sort of hunt, road movie chase going on. Meanwhile, Storm Dennis is lowering in from the north and uh, yeah, it all kicks off. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, um, it sounds brilliant. <laughs> yeah, can't wait to read it. I'm hooked. <laughs> Anne, um, your next one is a Matthew Venn, is that right? It is, yeah. So um, back to North Devon in the middle of a heat wave. And it's that, that one, if we're talking about how books started, that started with me. Um, I've got a friend who's a glass blower, and just thinking about that idea of blowing glass and using that almost as a motif all the way through because the glass is molten and it's flexible and you can do anything you can shape it and do anything with it and then when it's hard it it cracks and so looking at people who can deal with problems for so long and then then crack oh excellent. And yes it's, right. it's it starts off with someone with a shard of hand-blown glass is killed by a shard of hand blown glass. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. On the back of that, kind of related, would you ever take revenge on real people in your books? Either using their names or using a composite of their personalities? I'll go to you, Anne. I have done it once, yes. <laughs> but they would never recognise themselves. Interesting, but as long as you yeah. know who they are, that's fine. <laughs> that's all right. Because I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel revenge a lot, not, and it wasn't revenge for something that had happened to me, it was something that had happened to somebody else that I felt very strongly about, and I just wanted to get it out of my system, really. Fair enough. I'll forever wonder now when I read you away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, possibly, but I'm not going to say any more than that. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um... Moving on swiftly, do you have a favourite book or character that you've written, Kath? Oh, this is so hard. This question is know, sorry. so hard. Um, I think I, I just love all my characters, uh, which I hope doesn't sound like a sort of weird thing to say. <laughs> but um, once they're out there, 
they do sort of exist independently from me because everybody else who comes across them and reads them makes them their own you know what I mean it's so it so it so there's all these wonderful people I think out there living their life um and I think it's true of books too it's you know I have a, a a great affection for the books I've written and sometimes the quality of that affection shifts a little bit depending on you know my, my first feeling when I think of a particular book but I suppose I would have to say that the book that's that's particularly close to my heart at the moment is The Girl in the Green Dress which you referred to earlier yeah. um, and that is really because it, it was inspired by the experience of having a, a child who's transgender and you know and and trying to deal with the sort of level of ignorance and bigotry and hatred that is being directed at trans people at the moment so yeah I suppose that felt very close to home and um I you know I was I was glad to sort of have written that and it's provoked a lot of discussions with people and yeah comments from people and debate from people so I think that's what I hoped it would do. That's fantastic. Thank you. For I sharing. think that's my favourite of Kath's yeah. books, and I would recommend that to anybody to Thank if you. they want to start off if they've never read Kath before. Completely agree. Just, I, I just feel like you nailed all aspects of it. To be honest, Kath, it's just such a fantastic read. It really is. Yeah. And Anne, how about you? I I was thinking while Kath was talking, I think. Maybe Jen Rafferty, who's a character in the, the Matthew Venn series, who's a scouser who's moved down to Devon, who is one of these people who married too early and made a bad choice of husband and now is divorced with two teenage kids. And she never, she never did all the sowing of wild oats when she was young. So she's out there wanting to party hard a bit predatory, looking for a bloke. And I love, love writing her. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, Linda Hutchison is asking, I've always wondered how you name your characters and do any of your friends or family think you've named the character after them or do they have any mannerisms of people you know? So Anne, I'll go with you first. The names, I think for mine, are, I try and, uh, again, it's about place. So Shetlanders have different surnames from people who live in the northeast, uh, people in, in the southwest. I do prowl around graveyards a lot looking for names. And the only real people, that, the only names are people who maybe, um, uh, we sometimes auction names in books off for good for charities. So there's sometimes real people in them. And we've done that. Okay. Yes, I've never knowingly used um, names of, of people um, that I know. Although <laughs> I did write a book called Witness once. And in order to do the research, I spent a morning with the Witness Support Unit at Crown Courts in Manchester. And, you know, I, and I acknowledged and thanked the two women who'd, who'd enabled me to do that, who were working there. And later, um, Years after the book had come out, I met them again at a, at a literary festival in Manchester somewhere. And they came up to me and um, said, did you realise that you'd named two of the characters in the books after us? And I hadn't. They weren't big characters, but I had mentioned these women's surnames. And it was completely subconscious. I had no idea I'd done that. So that was a laugh. But <laughs> for me, I just spend hours. Uh, names are really important for me. I can't just put, oh, you know, Tom Smith. I, it's really important to get it right. It's like naming a baby or something. <laughs> so I'll go through all those, you know, popular names in 1958. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Down on, you know, Robert, Jonathan, you know, and try and work out what would fit the sort of emerging personality of who I'm writing about. And it, it can be a real problem to find one that you haven't used. And I think the other thing I'm always aware of is trying to make sure everybody's name has a different initial. Yeah. Because if you've got lots of people in your story and lots of suspects, you don't want them all called, you know, Martin, Miranda, Mary, whatever. So 
um, yeah, spend a lot of time looking at names. Excellent. Um, Keith Young would like to know, um, has the pandemic allowed you to write more or has it restricted you? Kath? I've probably written about the same. I've, I think I've had a, a slightly more relaxed approach to my writing mainly because you can't go anywhere there's no other time taken up with doing other stuff um and for me it's been wonderful being able to write because it's just been a comfort an escape you know while things have been so grim here and so hard for so many of us um I've been up there in the hills with Scarlett, driving in the rain and, and sort of working out ways of escaping from this lunatic father who's got her in his, in his Range Rover. So, yeah, so for me, it, it was just really, really helpful to have that. Mm. And Anne? Yeah, I think the same, that it did take me a while to, to be able to relapse back into writing in the first lockdown. I was obsessed with numbers and what was going to happen and um, and got quite scared about stuff, partly because I had my 11-year-old grandson staying with me because he was severely asthmatic and he'd come here to sort of shield so he wasn't at home with his siblings and who were still at school at that point. Yeah. Um, and obviously he, he went home quite quickly when we realised that kids were less likely to get it. But yeah. once I got back into the writing, it was a wonderful escape to be somewhere else and thinking about other things. And we're just so fortunate, I think, that we can work from home, that we're not having to be serving people in the supermarket or driving a taxi or driving a bus or yeah. being frontline yeah. staff in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, during lockdown, writing, uh, no, not writing, the other one, reading, reading was a big escape for me because it was, like you say, you couldn't go anywhere other than into the page of a book. So with that in mind, Teresa Starr would like to know what you're both reading at the moment. Kath? Oh, oh, oh. I've just started a book called November Road by Lou Burney, uh, which was a sort of highly recommended op for the gold dagger last year yeah um yeah and so far i'm really enjoying it it's set uh, just at the time of kennedy's assassination and it's going to be the story of a sort of mafia man mm -hmm. who's got a number on his back and uh, a housewife with two little girls who's walked out on a alcoholic husband and their paths crossed so i'm really looking forward to reading more interesting and I'm reading a book called The Birds That Stay by a Canadian writer called Anne Lambert. And I've only just started it, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen yet. Okay. It's set in rural, rural Quebec. Nice. So yeah, nice place to be. You've both kind of gone a little bit further in your reading um, than you can in real life at the minute. Just to remind our um, attendees, we do have the Q&A facility. So if you do have anything you would like these two wonderful ladies to answer, please do pop them in the Q&A box. Um, Paul Short would like to know, this is a really interesting one for me because I like to write in dialect. So um, do you ever struggle to balance dialect in your writing so that it could be understood by a wider audience, especially when you're writing about working class characters? I think... Um... I don't write in dialect, but you get a sense of rhythm, I think. And there are some words that I would use just to place, mm -hmm. place the action. So Shetland, especially, you know, I might use a word like piri, which means little, because Shetlanders would always use that. And, but it, and it's so obvious from the context that you wouldn't need to explain it. Okay. Um, but it's more about rhythm, I think. So listening to people's conversation and writing that into the dialogue. I like um, how, for example, around where we live, like is used as a kind of full stop often. I, yeah. Because I, I, I don't know that anybody else does it. Maybe they do, I've just not heard it. Um, Kath, how about you? Do you write in dialect much? Not really. I, I mean, I will write, sort of obviously people will use northern 
Lancashire or Northwestern or Mancunian expressions and you mm-hmm. know it's pecking the head or whatever to, to, to sort of which again you can understand even if you've not particularly heard that and it is interesting when 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 books go through the the uh, copy editing stage because the copy editor lives in the south and so she'll be saying uh, I've not heard this term is it widely used you know about particular bits of language and then there's a to and fro about well yeah I'd like to keep it in because I think you can gather what it means from the Mm. context or yes we say that all the time and yeah so but but yeah, I, I don't do the whole you know thing of drop of indicating where letters are dropped or whatever, yeah. um, which you might get in in more in, in proper dialect. You know, you get sort of more of that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, Effie Merrill would like to know if you didn't write crime, what would you write? Now, Kath, for you, I sometimes feel there's quite a bit of crossover with. <laughs> something to do with families yeah like family I, drama in a way possibly I think if I didn't write crime I'd probably write science fiction or children's fiction interesting Anne yeah I couldn't write children's fiction I think it would be general fiction it would be as you say about about families and community and what holds people together and what tears them apart but it's so much easier if there's a murder that does that <laughs> yes it's cheating really but it is <laughs> people love it Anne. it's fine <laughs> um jess bickerton would like to know how did you make the decision about whether to write from um the first point of view or as an omniscient narrator Anne. I've only written one first person novel. I've written more of uh, short stories with from the first person. First person in a novel, I find quite hard to sustain. And also, especially if you're writing traditional crime, because there are some times where you want the reader to know things. And if it's all in the first person, it's quite hard to do that. Mm. But it's, it's quite interesting. And I do alternate point of view throughout mm-hmm. the book so I don't have one omniscient narrator so yeah. one chapter might be told from Vera's point of view and the next from one of the one of the other characters so. yeah um all my private eye novels the Salco Kenny series they're all in the first person and that just worked in my head uh, for that character and those were the first books I wrote and she was very much my alter ego so it just just made sense to sort of you know, put her in Manchester, have her dealing with small children, which I was at the time, and, and send her off um, fighting crime on the main street. But part of my decision to try other, other stories like police procedurals and then standalones was about wanting more than one point of view. Yeah. So, so uh, I think it depends on the story you're telling, what decisions you make about points of view and how many you have and who's are pre- predominant and so on yeah great thank you Susie Aspley thanks Susie while online events have been fabulous I'll take it you mean ours are you looking forward to live book events coming back and which are your favorite festivals Kath well I can't I, wait I, I hate the technology <laughs> <laughs> my my wi-fi now is coming and going and I'm panicking as we're speaking um oh. Yeah, I can't wait. I don't care. Wherever, anywhere. <laughs> Just get me out of the house. Yeah, I I, I enjoy uh, Feakston's in, in Harrogate. Um, I've been to Bloody Scotland once and I thought that was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Um, but yes, I think I am looking forward to um, live events and to seeing people. But actually, I've also quite enjoyed doing online events and I've seen some people, I've seen other writers speak that I would never have yeah. managed to see uh, in real life, if you like. So, yeah, so I think there are, there are sort of pluses and minuses. And you do save a lot on sort of hotel bills and <laughs> train tickets. Booze. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, yeah, booze. So, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, can I ask nice. you a question? 
Me, yeah. But can I ask you a question? Will you be doing Bay Tales live when we can do it? Anne, that was a secret. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know. I'm just no, I know. asking. I know didn't. No, it was a secret between Simon and I, but yes, we are hoping to do that. Great. Brilliant. Oh, good. You're all welcome in our bay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we just need to... Oh, well, see it's my bay too. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's our bay. Yes. Um, yeah, so there you go, everyone. Everybody appreciates you asking that question, Anne, so thanks very much. Um, Nola Dennis would like to know, who do you write for? Do you ever write anything you wouldn't want your mother or your daughter to read or a relation? I write for me, hope, uh, yeah, I just write for me, hoping that people will enjoy it. I know um, my daughter, uh, one of our daughters has avoided reading some of the novels because I've said to the to her, you know, there's quite a bit of sex in that one, and she's mm. like, "Oh, mother, please!" <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, and and my auntie Mary complains now and again if there's, you know, she really didn't need to have that bit of, of you know, hanky panky. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, but no, I I I do try not to censor myself in that way. Um, and yes, um, I, I don't think I've ever written anything that my parents have, have thrown their hands up in horror about. Mm. Excellent, Anne? Yeah, I just write for myself, really. I, I write this exactly the sort of book that I would enjoy reading. And that is the common advice, isn't it? Read what you would like, sorry, write what you would like to read. Um, but it's quite interesting to hear both of you, very successful novelists, still writing for yourselves rather than writing for an audience, for example. That's really interesting. I think um, if, you, if you try and write for the market, that just doesn't work at all. Hmm. I think people don't realise initially like the lag time between writing it and then getting it out there. So that if you're trying to follow a trend, the trend's gone by the time it's, it's out there. Absolutely. Rose Cullen would like to know, do you find that the crime genre allows you to tackle larger themes and social issues? Anne? Absolutely, yeah. That's why crime's so amazing, because even if you're writing a police procedural, these days, I think most police officers spend as much of their time looking for missing teenagers who've run away from care or trying to find an emergency bed for someone with mental health problems as they are solving burglaries because the rest mm. of, of the support system is so stretched so absolutely that's that's why crime novel is is such a brilliant uh, genre to write within because we can explore those issues of social justice and family and domestic abuse and and all the things that we're we're so anxious about mm. yeah yeah definitely i mean um Quiet Acts of Violence, which is the book of mine that's out now, you know, that gave me an opportunity to write a lot about the sort of um, the, the poverty that people are living with at the moment and the gross inequalities that people are, are dealing with and the, the sort of the way the benefit system has been used to impoverish people. Mm -hmm. And this was before, this was written before the pandemic hit, and, and which has obviously highlighted a lot of those problems. Um, and to write about homelessness and, and sort of domestic servitude. So, so I think, yeah, cry, like Anne says, crime fiction is, is brilliant because you can look at all, at, at just about anything really, um, any of those big issues. Great. Um, just as an aside, Russ Thomas says he's with Auntie Mary. No need for hanky panky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm surprised at you, Russ. Um, a chap called John would like to know the books that you're currently working on. Do they reflect what's going on with respect to COVID? Kath? Mine does. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just about to embark on a, on a new one, I hope. And... Um, it won't, no, it will be set uh, probably in about 2018, 2019. Um, it, it, it's not a story that would particularly benefit mm. from having that 
extra agenda of, of writing about what's happening currently at the moment. And mm. I haven't ruled out writing a story set during this time, but um, my next book won't be that one. Okay. Um, the one that I'm writing at the moment has mentions of it. It's set um, at the end of last summer. So people were still able to get together and um, you know, we were having drinks outside. Wasn't that lovely? I can yeah. just vaguely remember it. And, but we were wearing masks and so not making a big deal of it, but just having that in the background because it seemed odd writing now not to have it as part of just the background. Yeah. Because, because it is going to be set, set at that particular time. So. Yeah. And we have the final question tonight from Dawn Titley. She's interested in how you feel when your characters are taken on and written by others, for example, in TV adaptations. How easy is it to let go of the characters? Kath? Um, for me with Blue Murder, it was, it was okay. Uh, I did some of those um, scripts and other writers then came on board for the subsequent series and did other scripts. Um, and they were interpreted, obviously, by the actors as well. So mm. you've got that sort of, you know, the extra thing that they bring to them. I think I was really fortunate because I was happy with what people did and I was really happy with, with how those characters were portrayed. Yeah. And I have heard from other writers who've had less happy experiences. Um, so I think I was very fortunate and, and uh, very pleased with what people did with my initial idea. Great. And Anne, I think you're more than happy with Brenda as Vera. Yeah, she's become a bit of an institution, hasn't she? She's yeah. so embedded with the character now. Yeah. But I think I decided because I, like Kath, I've, had, I've got a, a quite a close friend, Louise Penny, a Canadian writer, who was deeply upset with what happened to hers but got really quite anxious about it and quite angry about it and I decided right from the beginning that I would hand it over and I wouldn't meddle because I don't know what makes good television and I just thought I don't want to get in that state when I'm looking at them and but but they've got that wrong and they've mm. done this wrong and that, that just it wouldn't help the the, the final product because I'm sure that the director and the writers have a very clear vision for what they want to do and if I'm sticking my oar in every 10 minutes it's not going to help. Brilliant well thank you so much both of you for joining us this evening it's been as always lovely to talk to you both um, and hopefully we'll be seeing you in the bay live very soon. Um, <laughs> thank you very much and Cleves and Casting Cliff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to go for a break but I need to give you all a little bit of a warning and um, there appear to be some problems with Simon's internet connection so um, we're going to try and do this break watch out for how to enter the competition and um, if we'll have any problems we'll come back sooner but if not we'll see you in five. Thank you.
Welcome back. Really sorry, no music. Poor Anna Levine didn't get her, her moment there, but hopefully we are going to try and get her music played at the end of the show this evening. Now, we're really spoiling you. There's been three competitions on that break there. Um, I'll try and put them in the chat shortly. But we also have the opportunity for some of you to win Castine Cliff and Anne Cleep's books. How lucky are you? The competition this week, if you would like to win a book by Castine Cliff or Anne Cleaves, is send us your one word TV title based on your name and a one sentence pitch for it. So mine would be Vic. I don't know. This is why I'm not entering the competition. Um, Vic, killing people since 1999. That is not a confession. That is just an example of a tagline because I can't think of any others. So your one word TV title with your name and a one sentence pitch for it to baytales20 at gmail.com. Next though, we have a reading from Stephanie Robel. Um, I'm gonna tell you about Stephanie and her book, okay? The recovery of Rose Gold was Penguin Michael Joseph's lead crime debut of 2020. Woo! It received huge acclaim in the UK and the US and it's published in paperback tomorrow, the 18th of Feb. The recovery of Rose Gold is an explanation, no, it's not an explanation, oh Vic, an exploration of Munchausen syndrome by proxy and follows the story of Rose Gold who, after being poisoned by her mother for 18 years, makes the calculated decision to take her in after her prison sentence ends. Compared to Patricia Highsmith, the recovery of Rose Gold was chosen as a Richard and Judy Spring Book Club pick and was announced yesterday. So we here at Bay Tales are absolutely delighted to introduce you to Stephanie Robel. Hi. Hi, thank you, Vic. So I'm not going to explain too much of the background before I start my reading, but as Vic mentioned, um, the book is about a mother and daughter named Patty and Rose Gold Watts. And the story is told from both of their points of view in alternating chapters. And here's the new cover. As Vic said, it's coming out in paperback tomorrow. So the first chapter is from Patty, the mother's point of view, and I'm gonna be reading a bit from it. So without further ado, I'll get started. Chapter one, Patty, day of release. My daughter didn't have to testify against me. She chose to. It's Rose Gold's fault I went to prison, but she's not the only one to blame. If we're pointing fingers, mine are aimed at the prosecutor and his overactive imagination, the gullible jury, and the bloodthirsty reporters. They all clamored for justice. What they wanted was a story. And get out your popcorn because boy did they write one. Once upon a time, they said, a wicked mother gave birth to a daughter. The daughter appeared to be very sick and had all sorts of things wrong with her. She had a feeding tube, her hair fell out in clumps, and she was so weak she needed a wheelchair to get around. For 18 years, no doctor could figure out what was wrong with her. Then along came two police officers to save the daughter. Lo and behold, the girl was perfectly healthy. The evil mother was the sick one. The prosecutor told everyone the mother had been poisoning her daughter for years. It was the mother's fault the girl couldn't stop vomiting that she suffered from malnutrition. Aggravated child abuse, he called it. The mother had to be punished. After she was arrested, the press swooped in like vultures, eager to capitalize on a family being ripped apart. Their headlines screamed for the blood of poisonous Patty, a 50-something master of manipulation. All the mother's friends fell for the lies. High horses were marched all over the land. Every lawyer, cop, and neighbor was sure they were the girl's savior. They put the mother in prison and threw away the key. Justice was served, and most of them lived happily ever after. The end. But where were the lawyers while the mother was scrubbing the girl's vomit out of the carpet for the thousandth time? Where were the cops while the mother poured over medical textbooks every night? Where were the neighbors when the little girl cried out for her mother before sunrise? Riddle me this, if I spent almost two decades abusing my daughter, why did she offer to pick me up today? Connolly approaches my cell at noon sharp as promised. You ready, Watts? I scramble off my Pop-Tart of a bed and pull my scratchy khaki uniform taut. Yes, sir. I have become a woman who chirps. 
The pot-bellied warden pulls out a large ring of keys and whistles as he slides open my door. I am Connolly's favorite inmate. I pause in my cellie's bed, not wanting to make a scene, but Alicia is already sitting against the wall, hugging her knees. She raises her eyes to mine and bursts into tears, looking much younger than 20. Shh, shh. I bend down and wrap the girl in my arms. I try to sneak a peek at her bandaged wrist, but she catches me. Keep applying the ointment and changing those dressings. No infections, I say, wiggling my eyebrows at her. Alicia smiles, tears staining her face. She hiccups. Yes, Nurse Watts. I try not to preen. I was a certified nursing assistant for 12 years. Good girl. Diaz is going to walk the track with you today. 30 minutes, doctor's orders. I smile back, petting Alicia's hair. Her hiccups have stopped. You'll write me? I nod, and you can call me whenever. Squeezing her hand, I stand again and head toward Connolly, who has been waiting patiently. I pause at the threshold and look back at Alicia, making a mental note to send her a letter when I get home. One hour at a time. Alicia waves shyly. Good luck out there. Connolly and I walk toward intake and release. My fellow inmates call out their farewells. Keep in touch, you hear? We'll miss you, mama. Stay out of trouble, Skeeto. Short for Mosquito, a nickname given as an insult, but taken as a compliment. Mosquitoes never give up. I give them my best Queen Elizabeth wave, but refrain from blowing kisses. Best to take this seriously. Connolly and I keep walking. In the hallway, Stevens nearly plows me over. She bears an uncanny resemblance to a bulldog. Squat and stout, flapping jowls, known to drool on occasion. She grunts at me. Good riddance. Stevens was in charge until I got here. Never a proponent of the flies and honey approach, she is vinegar through and through. But brute force and scare tactics get you only so far, and they get you nowhere with a woman of my size. Usurping her was easy. I don't blame her for hating me. I wave my fingers at her coquettishly. Have a glorious life, Stevens. Don't poison any more little girls, she growls. Strangling her isn't an option, so I kill her with kindness instead. I smile, the epitome of serenity, and follow Connolly. The intake and release center is unremarkable. A long hallway with concrete floors, too wide of walls, and holding rooms with thick glass windows. At the end of the hallway, there is a small office area with desks, computers, and scanners. It could be an accounting firm if all the accountants wore badges and guns. At the reception desk, the clerk's chair is turned toward the radio. A news program plays. After a short break, the reporter says, we have the story of a baby boy gone missing in Indiana. Plus, could candy be tied to cancer? That's next on WXAM. I haven't watched, listened to, or read the news since my trial. The press destroyed my good name. Because of them, my daughter didn't speak to me for four years. And that is the end of my reading today. To find out what else happens, you can buy the book anywhere books are sold. Thanks, Vic. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It was a pleasure hosting you again. And also to say we do have two copies of The Recovery of Rose Gold. So if you would like to um, win a copy from us, please email that email address with Rose Gold in the subject. Thank you very much for joining us, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Thanks, Stephanie. Bye. So, it didn't quite go as planned. Go. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> One day. Uh, good job we're not flying a plane, so right. that's all I can say. It'll be good when we're live. Live, live. Um, right, so, I guess you might want to do your book to film next time? I'll try and do it next time. It's cursed. That, that's what it is. <laughs> and you do keep freezing. So if, if I suddenly just look even more inattentive or clueless than usual, <laughs> it's because you've just frozen. So um, apologies for the music and the break. We will try and um, play that over the, the uh, end slide. So do keep watching. Um, it is a beautiful track by Anna Levine. So um, stay around if you can. Um, if you've enjoyed the show, please do consider donating to our, um, as displayed, it's kind of like the, the ITV game shows there behind Vic, uh, the cool <laughs> slash fi dot com, uh, cool slash fi dot com backslash bay tales. The shows, we try to make them free for everyone coming, um, but they're not cheap to put on. So any help you can provide, we, we won't ask for um you know, we won't charge, but if you can make a donation, it would really help us out. So thank you very much for that. 
follow us on Twitter at Bay underscore Tales. <laughs> uh, make sure you put the underscore in because there is a Bay Tales with one follower that's been active since 2011. Um, and they're probably getting very confused why people join them and then unjoin them. So we are Bay underscore Tales at um, Twitter and Straight Bay Tales on Facebook. Vic. Oh, poor Simon. I feel so bad for you today. You're having a day, aren't you? His printer doesn't work. His internet doesn't work. Um, thank you so much to all of our guests today, Alex Hawley, Anne Cleves, Cass Staincliffe and Stephanie Robel. I'm going to thank Anna Levine anyway, because hopefully you're going to hear her music in a moment. And to all of you for spending the evening with us. It's been, as always, an absolute delight. I believe, Simon, correct me if I'm wrong, show four is available for sign up now. Show four is now available at um, www.baytales.com slash events. Um, you can see who's on there, although we did give it a bit of a, a reveal in the break there, if you haven't seen that. But go to the events page on Baytales, have a look at the rest of the website. And if you like it, um, we have the Hall of Fame featuring all of the authors who've donated stories, who've appeared on the show. Um, go to the Hall of Fame, you can see more about them, click through to their full profiles. If you want to join, it's uh, for the member section where you get free fiction um, every week and non-fiction and videos and competitions and more. Do that. I've no idea whether anybody can hear me or see me. It's I feel like Terry all- Morgan used to be on the Eurovision at the moment, but <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so if you've enjoyed tonight and want to revisit whatever Anne and Kath said, or you want to hear about the book that Alex has reviewed, or you want to listen to Stephanie's reading again, this video will be on our members section of the Bay Tales website. So you must be a member if you want to watch it back. Um, anyway. Show 4 is available to sign up now. We're delighted to present a panel called Beyond Writing with Leslie Cara, Lauren North and Rob Parker. Um, We might be doing some other stuff before then, but you'll just need to keep an eye on our social media to find out what's happening. As it is, thank you very much. Have a lovely evening and we'll see you on the 31st of March.